Hello, welcome back. This is lecture number two in our iOS course. Today we're going to give you an introduction to the Swift programming language. We'll give you a little overview, we'll do our obligatory hello world, and then we'll look at some very basic concepts like how to define variables and constants, working with strings, the various collection types that we have available to us. Uh, we'll also look at control flow, looping and branching. And we'll wrap it up with a discussion of functions. So Apple surprised the iOS developer community back in June 2014, almost a year ago, when they announced the Swift language at the Worldwide Developer Conference, Apple's annual developer conference. So Swift is an industri industrial quality systems programming language. Um, and it's actually very expressive, uh, very much like some of the higher level scripting languages. So it has all the, the fun and joy that you get in languages like Ruby and Python. And yet it compiles into very efficient code. It's a systems programming language. It offers a seamless access to the existing Cocoa frameworks. So the frameworks that make up the iOS platform um, all integrate very cleanly into the Swift language. Swift is the successor to Objective-C, which was, uh, up until recently, the native language of choice on Apple platforms. But Swift provides mix and match interoperability with Objective-C code. So we can actually write an iOS application that has some components written in Swift and others written in Objective-C. So why did Apple create a new language? Well, first of all, uh, the idea here is that Swift makes it easier for less experienced programmers to get up to speed in iOS development. Objective-C had its share of warts. It was a language that was basically an extension of um, the C programming language. And so syntactically, there were lots of things that were confusing to a lot of programmers when they were initially introduced to it. A new language was also necessary in order for Apple to ensure compatibility with existing frameworks. So this is why they didn't adopt an existing modern language like Python or maybe even Ruby. It was much easier to actually create a new language that looks and feels modern but still integrates really well with the, object, the legacy Objective-C and C conventions that Apple platforms have. Some of the characteristics of the Swift programming language are that it's compiled. This means that the source code gets compiled down into binary code. It is not interpreted like many modern languages. It supports strong and static typing. That means the types are very clearly identified in the code and cannot change over the course of the program. And strong and static typing basically translates into um, an opportunity for the compiler to generate faster and safer code. Swift supports automatic reference counting. That means objects are automatically freed from memory when there's no more references to them. So this is very different from the original C programming environment where all of the memory um, has to be managed directly by the programmer or C++. And it's also different than Java where there is a garbage collector that runs periodically and sweeps memory and cleans up anything that's orphaned, anything that no longer has references to it. Instead, in automatic reference counting, the objects themselves keep track of how many other objects are referring to them and when nobody is referring to them anymore then they can be automatically freed from memory. So this feature of course was added to Objective-C um, not long ago but now we in Swift we, we basically don't have to manage the memory by ourselves. It's going to do it for us. It's also a namespaced language. That means it's much easier for our code, code that we write, to coexist with other people's code. And this is something that's very imp important, especially um, seeing how open source uh, plays such a big part of our lives if we are software developers. In Objective-C, we didn't really have this concept. And that's why in Objective-C, many of the classes that you work with have some type of prefix 
For example, in the foundation framework, you'll see an NS prefix in a lot of Objective-C classes, and that stands for Next Step, which was the original operating system from Next Computer Corporation that the current platforms at Apple have evolved from. So we always talk about hello world when we learn a new language. So there you have on the screen in front of you our first program just print line hello world and it simply does exactly as you might expect. It prints the string hello world out to the console. Now this is a complete legal Swift program. Notice there's no imports, there's no includes, it's simply a single statement. Notice also that there's no main program. Code written at global scope becomes the entry point and we start running wherever we've got code at global scope. And probably the most interesting thing is there are no semicolons. Now there are semicolons actually used in Swift. If we have more than one statement on a line we need to use semicolons to separate them and we also use semicolons in, in certain constructs like um, certain forms of the for loop will use semicolons but in general we don't put semicolons at the end of the lines and if you're somebody that is coming from a C or a C++ or even Java pedigree this is probably something you'll find yourself constantly adding semicolons but you really don't need to so now let's look at some of the features of the Swift language. And what I want to do is, is basically expose you to some of the basics. And we're going to do this by going right into Xcode and creating what's called a playground. A playground allows us to simply doodle or, or interactively play around with the uh, Swift language and, and try things out. So I'm going to switch over to Xcode and um, I'm going to create a new playground and I'll call this um, my demo playground and here we are in the playground and it generated some code here we're just gonna get rid of it and the first thing we want to look at is how we can define variables and constants so let's start out with constants to define a constant we're going to use the let keyword. So I can say something like let implicit const equals 25. And there's a couple things uh, to note here. First of all, notice I didn't specifically specify a type on this statement. I simply said let Im implicit const, so that's my variable name, equals 25. So what's happening here is Swift is inferring from the uh, statement that 25 is an integer and so it's typing this constant to integer hence the the reason I named the variable implicit const. Now I can also give a type when I'm defining a constant so I can say something like let and I'll just name this uh, variable explicit const and I'll type it to string and assign a value. So this creates a string constant called explicit const and here I've explicitly typed it. So we don't need to actually ex express the type when we're defining a constant. Uh, the Swift will infer it based on whatever we assign it to the first time and we don't have to necessarily assign the variable when we um, uh, declare it either. For example I could define a double I could say let explicit double and we'll, we'll say that is a double and notice now I haven't really done anything and if we look over to the right you can see these values so Swift evaluates them and, and we can play around and, and look at the values but here I haven't defined explicit double to anything so it hasn't shown anything yet and later on in my code somewhere I could actually do an assignment to this value so or to this constant so now I've defined 3.14 to it and it's uh, finalized. So the let statement lets us define constants. And we can only assign a value once to a variable that's defined as a constant. And the type has to be exactly the same as the type declaration. 
So in this last example I did, I set it to explicit double. If I would have said explicit double equals and then put some string value, I would have gotten an error message. So when we define constants, the types can be implicit and determined by Swift based on what we're assigning to the value variable, or it can be explicit. Variables let us create uh, mutable uh, variables. So I could say something like this. I could say var uh, a nice message equals by. And notice that, once again, my type is implicit here. Because I've assigned it to a string, Swift is going to assume that this variable is a string. I can also explicitly define the type. So I could say var my counter, and I'll set the type to integer. So integer is uh, capital I and T, and I'll assign it to one. So now I've defined a integer, and I've assigned it a one. And it's mutable, so I could do things. I could do like this prefix increment on my counter. And when I do that, if we look over to the right, you'll see that it indeed did in, uh, in, increment. So I've got a two value there now. So I can actually change this thing. I can also define a new string on the, on the previous variable. So I could say a nice message is my counter is. And I can also create new strings um, by doing concatenation. So I could say, um, oops, what's going on there? Oh, I only had one S here, so let me fix that. Okay, so that's fixed. So I could say something like this, doing concatenation. I could say let message equals a nice message plus, and notice I cannot expect Swift to implicitly um, convert type. So if I wanted to put my counter here, I need to actually type it, turn it into a string by calling this string and putting um, my counter in parentheses. And now if I look at what I got out of that, I've got a string my counter is 2. So the var statement is used to define variables um, whose values can be mutated. And the value that we assign to these, just like in the case of constants, has to be the same type as the variable name, and that type can be implicit or explicit. Type conversion in Swift is always explicit. We can't expect it to do conversions automatically or implicitly like we do in other languages such as C. So let's look at strings a little bit more closely. Let's define a new string. And I'll call it a string. And we'll say that this is equal to favorites. And I could define constants, green, red, blue, and make these all strings. And if I wanted to do multiple statements on one line, as I, as I mentioned a few moments ago, I can actually do that by using semicolons. So I can assign these variables values all on the same line, and I just have to enter semicolons to separate them, and I don't need one on the last one. Now I could use um, string concatenation once again, and, and those of you that know C or Java will recognize this syntax. So I can say something like this, a string plus equals, so that takes everything that's currently in the string and adds to it this expression. So I'm just going to put these different values separated by commas. And if we look at what we get, uh, what did I, oop, sorry, this needs to be blue. And if we look at what we get, we get favorites, green, red, blue. So a string is, is really just an ordered collection of characters. And Swift strings are actually bridged to Objective-C's underlying representation of a string, which is an NS string object. Now string is a what we call a value type. And what that means is when it's passed to a function or a method, which we'll talk about later, it's going to be copied. So it's passed by value. It's not passed 
by reference. And in this regard, if you already know Objective C, Swift is quite different because NS strings are always sent by reference in Objective C. Note also that strings can be mutated if we define them with var. If we define a string with a let statement, it's a constant. It cannot be mutated. Once again, those of you that know Objective-C will recall that in Objective-C there was two different classes. NS string was an immutable string and if you wanted to create a string that could be mutated you had to use a separate class, a, a, uh, a subclass called NS mutable string. In Swift we can determine whether a string is mutable or not by using either var or let to define it. So we've already seen that concatenation can be done with the plus operator. We can also do um, interpolation um, using a, a special backslash um, um, parentheses operation. We can do comparisons with equal and there's also a has preset prefix have suffix. Let's look at some of these uh, facilities we have for handling strings. So I'm going to define a string here um, called language and I'll set it to Swift and I'll set an integer uh, productivity and I'll set it to 10 and now I can create a new string. I could say var output is equal my favorite language and we'll just add in the variable language here makes me and now I'll do interpolation so within a string if I put a backslash and then parentheses and I put a variable or an expression in the parentheses it will actually interpolate and create a new string uh, referencing those variables so I can go like this. So this backslash and then productivity in parentheses is the interpolation um, operator. Ah, I see. I forgot to put the string Swift in quotes. Okay, so having done that, now I can see that the string produced here it interpolates or places the 10 integer value in there by using this uh, particular expression. I can also do comparisons of strings using the equal operator. So I could say something like this. I could say if language equals, and notice we use a double equal, so equal equal Swift, then I could print line hurrah. else okay in this case language does equal Swift so it prints out hurrah there's also um, the ability on the string class there's methods to check if a string starts or ends with a particular string so I could say something like this I could say if output has prefix and then just put the prefix I'm interested in in quotes here or it could be another string variable if this is true then we're gonna print out yup and if we look sure enough it printed yup and we could also check to see if it ends with a particular string so I could say something like if output um, has suffix and for suffix here we'll put 10x more productive and sure enough we can see that in this case both of those conditions were true. Let's move on and talk about arrays in Swift. So arrays store ordered lists of values and all the values in a Swift array are going to be of the same type. And this again is something that's different from Objective C's NS array. So if you're coming from Objective C, this is a difference. In Swift, the types 
of the values stored in arrays have to be homogeneous. We can access these values via methods um, or even properties or by using subscripting. So let's give an example. So I can define array as follows. Let's say I wanted to define a shopping list and it is an array of, of strings. So I could say um, var shopping list and I'm going to type it to be a string array. So the way I do that is I simply put the type in square brackets. And then I can also do array literals. So I could say milk, eggs, bread. And what I've just done is created a, a single array called shopping list. And it's got three string values in it, milk, eggs, and bread. And you can see over here on the right, that's indeed what Swift uh, turned this into. So I can figure out how many things are in it by calling um, the, or accessing the account property. So I could do something like this. So let me just interpolate here. So there are, and then I'll put an expression, shopping list dot count items in the list. And if we look over here, sure enough, there are three items in the list. So that worked. And uh, we can look at individual values. So for example, I could do something like this. The last item is okay. And if we look, it says the last item is bread. And that is indeed what it is. So notice from this, I used two. So arrays, like many languages, are zero based in Swift. So milk is in position zero, eggs in one and bread in two. I can add a new element to the array by using the append method. So I could say something like this. I could say um, shopping list dot append and put some chips on my list. And if we look, sure enough, it's got chips on the list. I could also um, concatenate a whole array onto another array by using syntax very much like the concatenation that we looked at a few minutes ago of strings. So I could say shopping list plus equals and then I could put an array here. So I could say dog food and cat food. And if I look down here, um, we can't really see it here. Let me expand this. There are six elements and so the original three plus chips and now dog food and cat food. So I've got um, six elements in the array. If I wanted to iterate through an array, I could use a for loop to do this. So I could do something like this. I could say um, for item in shopping list and simply put a block of code and I could just print line. So item is going to contain that value each time and it looped six times and if I want to see that I can go over here and I can look at the list and here's my output. I can see those items that were produced by this um, list. There's also another way we could do this in a for loop. So let's take a look at that. We could say something like this. We could say for item value in enumerate shopping list and then a block of code and we'll print line here and we'll say item and then I'll interpolate uh, index plus one and then I'll put the value. Okay, And if we look at what we get here, um, okay, it's still computing. What do I have wrong here? Um, oh, I see. This was actually item, not index. So let me change that. And once I do that, you can see I've got a loop that ran six times. And sure enough, I've printed out both the index uh, plus one along with the respective uh, values. So those are arrays. We also have dictionaries in Swift. Dictionaries allow us to store multiple values, again, of the same type. Um, but each value has associated with it a unique key. Um, 
And the other thing about dictionaries is the order is not specified, so it really doesn't matter. We're going to be retrieving things from the dictionary um, using keys. And, and so we'd use this type of a, a collection the same way we'd use a dictionary in the real world. If you wanted to look up something with a given key value, we can look it up. Now, the keys themselves must be hashable. And most of the time, this this point isn't really going to be a big deal for you because all the values you're going to use typically as keys will be hashable. So all of the Swift types that we would most likely be using for a key are indeed hashable. But if we ever did something really custom with our own classes, we'd want to make sure um, they are hashable. So let's look at some syntax for dictionaries. So I can define a dictionary as follows. So I'm going to call one here called language likes. And it's going to be a dictionary. And notice the the way I do this, I'm going to specify that the key type is string and the value that it's mapping to is an int. So there is my type and I can actually define dictionaries as literals as well. So I could say the key Java is going to map to the value or the integer 10. The key Objective C is going to map to the value 2. The key Swift is going to map to the value 12. The key VB is going to map to 0. So there I've just defined a dictionary with four keys and values associated with each of those keys. Now to retrieve a value out, I can use um, subscripting, but instead of using an integer index, I'm actually going to use the key value. So I could say something like this. I could say Java likes and if I wanted to know exactly uh, what the value, the, the integer value is for Java in my array, I can say something like this. I can say language likes and then put in parentheses the actual key. And notice these are case sensitive, so I want to do it exactly like that. And if we look um, down here, ah, I have a typo here. I thought it was likes and it was likes, so likes. So now, if you look down here, you see the value 10 has been retrieved. And I can also do assignments to specific values in the array using the same notation, only on the left side of the equal sign. So I could say language likes sub, and then I'll just say Ruby equals 15. And this will now add an item to the, um, to the uh, dictionary associating Ruby uh, with 15. So I can iterate through um, items in dictionaries in a, in a way similar to what we just saw with arrays. So I could say something like this for uh, language like, so the key value is, or the key is going to come back to us in a variable called language and the integer value is going to come back in likes. And then I can just specify in in the name of the dictionary and put my code block and I'll do another print line and uh, we'll put here some interpolation so we'll say language maps to and then I'll put likes and a close parenthesis and if we go over here it iterated five times, and if we expand that, we can see the five entries in our dictionary. All right, so let's talk about control flow. We've seen a few for loops already with uh, arrays and dictionaries. Um, for loops uh, can be done in a variety of different styles in Swift. One of the things we can do is iterate over a range. So I could say something like this. I could say for index in one and then dot, dot, dot. It's three dots. Make sure you, you note that detail. It's not two dots, it's three dots. And this varies the loop control variable index from one to five inclusive. So I could put a body in here that looks like this. I could print out that index value times five is, and then I'll put an expression inside this interpolation operator. So I'm going to multiply the index by 5 and put my final parenthesis. And if we look at what we got there, oops, we got an error. 
um, index times five. Um, there we go, five times. And if we expand that, you can see that it, it did indeed loop five times. We can also do what's called C style loops in Swift. So we could do something that looks very similar, but not exactly the same as the way you've done loops in C and Java. So we could say something like this, uh, var, and then we'll define a loop variable and we'll initialize it right away. And then we have a condition, um, index less than or equal to five in this case. And notice how I'm separating these with indexes and then I'll increment here, put my body, and then I'll go ahead and put this exact same line here in the body. Oh, I need a space here. And once again, it does exactly the same as the, uh, the previous loop there. Um, we can also uh, have a form of the for loop where we use underscores if we don't actually need to access the loop control variable. So we could do something like this. So I'll just define some constants here. And notice I can do multiple constants on one line if I comma separate. And then a variable answer, which I'll set to one. And uh, then I'll do a loop that says this, it says four. And then I use an underscore in and then a range. So from one to power, and I'll say answer times equals the base. So I can compute um, a value raise to a particular power and then I'll print it out. So I could say um, that my base to the power of power is my answer. Okay, and if we look, we can get three to the power of 10 is some great big huge uh, number. We can also do while uh, do loops. So let's just do a real simple loop. We'll do something very similar to what we um, uh, just did with the for loop. So I'll define a variable n, which I set to five, and a counter, which I set to one. And then I'll do a do while first, so I can say, do and then I'll put a code block and I'll print out uh, the same line um, very similar to what we did before oops see didn't mean that so um, print line and I'll say count times five is and then count times five and down here in the bottom, I'll put a loop and I'll say do this while the count is less than or equal to five. And if we look, um, oopsie, got a problem here. I forgot to increment my counter, so it's in an infinite loop. So let me go add that. So we need to be sure to increment the counter. And sure enough, it goes five times and does exactly what you might expect it to do. And we can do a regular while loop. So in a do while, the condition obviously is at the end, but I could do a, um, a while as well. So, um, well, we, we'll just skip that. You, you know uh, a while would just do exactly the same thing, only put the condition at the top. Let's look at an if then else statement. So I'm gonna define a variable temp and we'll sign it to 50. And then I'll say if temp less than or equal 32 and then I'll print out a message it is freezing out here okay else and then I can do another if I could say if a temp is greater than 32 and so there's a logical and it's less than or equal to 80 if this is true then we're gonna print out um, how temperate it is here. And we could do more. We could say else if the temp is greater than 80 and less than or equal to 100, then we'll say it is a sweatshop here. Else and if none of the other conditions turned out to be true, 
it will fall into this block here and we're just going to say that the thermometer is broken. So based on this value you can see that it printed out how temperate is in here because we've sent the temperature to 50. So we can write logic in this manner. There's also a switch statement in objective or in Swift uh, switch statement. So the switch statement here is very similar to C syntax but it has some notable differences. First of all we don't need to use the break statements in every case like we always had to do in C as well as Java. There's also no implicit fall through. So if we forget the break it doesn't automatically keep executing in the case that follows the current one. It actually ends. Each case also must contain at least one executable statement. And the case condition can actually be a scalar, it could be a range of values, or it could even be a tuple. And we'll be talking about tuples in our next lecture, so stay tuned. There's also some interesting syntax that allows the case condition to actually bind values to variables that could be referenced in the block. So let's just look at a simple case statement. So I'll define a variable t and it's going to be an int that I set to 32 and uh, we'll write a switch statement on t. So we'll say switch t and I'll put a break and then I can put out cases and notice I can do ranges here. So I could say so if it's 0 through 32 then print line it is freezing out here. We're going to do the same thing we did before and uh, I can do another case and I'll go 33 to 80 and if we get that we say how temperate it is here and I could do the next case so I'll go from 81 to 100 and it's a sweatshop if we fall into that one and then finally for everything else we can use the keyword default and everything that doesn't match one of the previous cases will end up in this one. Okay, and if we look at what happened here, it says it's freezing out here because we set it to 32. So that's the switch statement. Let's wrap up our session today by looking at functions in Swift. Functions are self-contained chunks of code that perform a specific task. Functions are going to be typed by both their return type as well as the type of each of its parameters. Now Swift supports first-class functions and what that means is functions can be passed as arguments and serve as return values as well. So functions aren't treated any different than data in that regard. We'll also see that functions in Swift can be nested and also Swift functions can have multiple return values so we're not stuck with just one. So let's define a function in Swift. We do this by introducing a function with the name func or the keyword func. And then we give the name of the function so we'll say state your mission and then we list out the um, parameters as well as their types. So I'm going to have a parameter called action verb and it's going to be of type string. So there is a function with the name state your mission, action verb is the input parameter with string and it's going to return a string. So we do that by using this little arrow uh, key and that says it returns a string and then we can follow it with simply a block of code that will execute whenever this function is called. So in my block here I'm going to do something as follows. I'm going to say let my mission, so this is a local constant variable, and I'll concatenate a string in here. And then I'll simply return that string as the return value. Oops. Return mission. Okay. There's my function. And now I can invoke it by simply saying, um, the name of the function in parentheses, so I'll print the output of it in this case, so I can call it 
by simply listing the name of it and then passing in an argument. If we look at what we get there, you notice it says, I will walk the dog. We can also pass multiple parameters to a function. So let me just cut this, copy and paste this function, and we'll add a parameter to it. So there's my function, and we'll add an additional parameter here. So in addition to the action verb, we're going to add a noun. So we comma separate them, and my parameter name is going to be noun, and it too is a string. And uh, I'll use that noun down here. I'll replace um, what I had there before. So we'll say the and then noun. And if we call this one, and we need to pass two both the action verb as well as the noun. And if we look at what we got here, it says, I will walk the cat, just like we might have expected. Now, functions can return multiple values as well. These are actually what we refer to as tuples in Swift. And we'll go into a lot more detail in our next lecture on tuples. But for now, let's just look at a simple example of a function that will return multiple values. So I'm going to find one called uh, find the center. And this function takes in four integer values, x1, y1, x2, and y2. And it returns. Instead of a single value, it returns a tuple with two values. So one of the values is going to be x, which is int, and one will be um, y, which is also int. Then I can put my code block. And in this code block, I'm simply going to return. And then I put in parentheses x2 minus x1 divided by 2 is my first value, and y2 minus y1 divided by 2 is my second value. And now if I call this, I'll say print line, uh, find the center, and I'll give it the values. And if we look at what we get back here, sure enough, we get two values back, 5 and 5. Now, so far, all the functions we've seen have defined what we refer to as local parameter names. That means they're only known in the um, function implementation themselves. But sometimes it's useful to name parameters when you call the function as well. So these are named parameters, or in Swift, we call them external parameter names. So let's take a look at that, um, external parameter names in functions. So I'll define a new function here called join, and it takes a string, two strings, and a joiner string. So three ver um, variables of the same type, and it returns a string as well. And the logic here will be to concatenate s1 plus the joiner string plus s Two. So for example, when I call this, um, oops, I got a typo there. So when I call this, um, I'll do something like this. Join hello is my s1, world is my s2, and then my joiner will be a comma space. And if we look at what this returns, Oh boy, it seems I have another error here. Uh, sometimes these uh, playgrounds just kind of lock up. They don't give you an error message. Um, oh, I see the problem. It's uh, right here in my function parameter list. I forgot a comma right there. Um, so that should do it. So now I got hello, comma, world. Um, so that's kind of the way we've already seen it. This is just has local parameter names. Now let's add external. Uh, parameter names. And so to do this, I'm going to copy and paste 
this um, same function. Uh, we'll just go ahead and add it right here. So what I can do is add a name. So if this was the string, and we want to call this one maybe to string, and we want to call this one with joiner. As soon as we do this, now when we actually call, those are external parameter names. So when we call um, the function, we have to use those names. So I have to say, in other words, string for the first one, to string for the second one, and with joiner for the third one. Okay, and if we look, we get the exact same output as we did before. Now, there's one more um, shorthand that Swift gives us for these. Instead of um, typing it this way, if we actually wanted to use the same external parameter name as internal, which we want to do in a lot of cases, that makes sense. You can do it as follows. So we'll get rid of that internal parameter name and just put a pound in front. And that says both the internal and the external parameter name is going to be string. In this case, we'll do two string. And we'll get rid of this. And we'll do the same thing with joiner. And we'll get rid of joiner. And then down here, we're going to have to change these as well. That one's good. Um, oops, here we got to do that as well. So in the implementation, so this would be string. And this would be with joiner. And this would be to string. And down there, that remains the same. Okay, so there's a nice shorthand for doing um, functions where the external parameter names are the same as the internal. Now we can define variables that actually refer to a function. Remember we said functions are first class functions in Swift. That means we can define variables and pass functions around. So let me define a couple of functions here. Um, we'll define a function called add two ints that takes two integers and adds them together. So we'll take a and b and it's going to return an int and this function is going to be implemented simply by saying return a plus b and then I'll have a second function that multiplies two functions or two integers. So multiply two ints and once again it's going to take an a and a b and return us an int and this one returns a times b. So there I've got two functions and I can define a variable that refers to one of these functions as follows. I could define a variable named math function and math function is defined as the type of this function. So I put my colon. The type is a function that takes two ints and returns an int. And I can express that as follows. I can put in parentheses those two parameters which are the inputs and then I can specify with my arrow the outputs and then I can actually assign it to something and I simply use the name of functions that I've already defined. And so in this case I'll say um, define it to these two, uh, this add to ints. Good grief, this auto completion sometimes gets in your way. And uh, now if I want to call this function that's referred to by the variable I can simply say um, I can, I, I can just simply just re reference the name, so I could say the results of this function, and then I'll interpolate and call the function inside the interpolation operator, math function, and I'll pass in four and six. And then I need my closing parenthesis, and if we go back here, um, it says results equals 10. So we can call another one. So I could just reassign that variable to a different value. So I could say math function, since it's a variable and not a constant, is equal to multiply two ints. Oops. And similarly, I could call that one. So let me just cut and paste 
the same line of code here. And if I call it again, this time I get, oops. So what do I get? Um, multi Oh, this is wrong. Multiply two ints. Okay, and so this time I get 24, which is exactly what I spe expected. Now I can also pass that function to a function. So I can pass a function as an input parameter to a function. Let's take a look at that. So we'll define a function here. Um, we'll define a function and we'll call this function um, print math results. And the first parameter is going to be a function that we're passing it. So I'm going to call this math function. And the type of this guy, once again, just like when we define the variable, is a function that takes two ints and returns an int. And I'm also going to take an integer a and an integer b as input to this function. And in the implementation of the function, I'll simply print out the uh, same thing I had here. So let me copy this line. And instead of 4 and 6 hard-coded, we're actually going to pass in those two parameters that we um, just got. So there it is, and now I can call this. So I'm, I'm literally going to pass in a function to a function. So I'll call this by saying print math results, and I'm going to pass that variable that it defined previously. So I'll, or no, I'll just pass a, liter, a, a name of a function here. So I'll say add to ints, and then I'll say uh, three and five. And if we call that, sure enough, we get a result of 8. Now, functions can also be return values of functions. We can uh, have a function that returns a reference to a function. So let me just write a few functions here uh, to demonstrate this. So I'm going to have a function um, called step forward that takes an input of an int and returns an int. And this one simply takes the input and uh, increments it by one. And I'll have a second one called step backwards that does something very similar, only in this case it decrements. So those are my two functions, and now I could write a, another function that returns um, one of these functions. So I could write a function here called uh, choose step function, and then I'll have a boolean uh, backwards as the input, and the output or the return value of this is once again going to be a function that returns an int, or that takes an int and returns an int. And then I can put my block here and I can say something like this. If backwards is true, and this is syntax that comes from C originally, I can put a question mark here. And if it's true, I'll take the first one here, which is backward, step backward. And if it's false, it'll take the, the one after the colon here, which is step forward. Okay. And now let's go ahead and call this and, and see how this, this works. So I'll set a value, um, curve L, and I'll set it to 3. And then I will um, um, set a constant equal to the function that I'm getting back from calling that previously defined function. So I'll say move near to 0. And then I'll say choose a step function, and I'm going to send it true. So I want this thing to go backwards or decrement. And now if I call it, I can say my curve val is equal to, and now I'll simply dereference that variable, move near to zero, and send in the curve val, 
And sure enough, the function returns a two. So I've actually written a function that returns another function. Now we could rewrite this example that we just created um, by, by nesting these. So let me take this function and copy it down here. And then we'll call this, uh, for lack of a better name, this is my step backwards um, um, version two. And uh, we'll, we'll put copies, so we'll nest these guys right inside there. Um, so we'll put it right here. And uh, I could then take this down here. And we'll just go ahead and get rid of the um, original functions here. And so now, um, this choose step function v2, okay, if we call this, um, and we also need to uh, put the appropriate names. here, oops, uh, I put the wrong one here, I didn't actually want this one, um, I wanted the uh, step forward, so let me just copy and paste and fix this up, so this one should have been step forward, and it's going to increment. Step forward. Okay. So there we go. And now when we call these, we get the same result. But you can see that the functions are actually nested or defined um, within the function itself and still returned as, as a value. So those are the basics of Swift. Um, all of this code is, is online. So you can download the Playground um, and play with it yourself. In our next lecture, we're going to dig a little bit deeper and look at some more um, advanced topics in Swift. So please come back and watch the next lecture.